Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I would like to thank everyone for watching, for everyone for being here. Um, this uh, discussion is titled Understanding Blood Meridian. There's been a growth of people who are reading it for the first time recently. I see it in the communities I'm involved in. There are people who reach out to me, and um, a lot of people go down the typical avenues of saying, oh, well, it was recommended by Harold Bloom or something like that, and they either express some kind of wonderment at it, um, because it is a completely singular piece of literature, or a lot of them are really struggling with it. And I'm not particularly more informed than anyone else, but uh, I wanted to shed some light on Blood Meridian in, in general. It's a very cryptic novel. It's very elaborate. It's very complicated. And the inspirations and the themes are not apparent. Um, and all the content that I see on YouTube um, is not really satisfactory to understanding it. There's a great three-part um, documentary that's kind of, it's almost like a Ken Burns documentary describing the America at the time in the 1840s and 50s with Manifest Destiny and the Mexican-American War. And it's, it's fantastic. I'll edit it into the description. Uh, I think I forgot. Um, but what people really want to know, because they open the book and it's very, it's a lot of information at once and it doesn't seem to connect very uh, fluidly, they want a way to approach it and they want a way to gain insight into the actual book itself, which um, a lot of material doesn't offer. At the same time, there's, uh, there are lectures and there's material from PhDs and professors at prestigious universities that don't really do the book any justice. And it's really amazing. Um, I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for that. There, are, there was a Harvard professor who said there was no morality in Blood Meridian. I find that very interesting. Um, there are other professors who do talks, and they just don't really satisfy me personally. Um, so in general, the difference between this discussion and any other discussion is that I'm drawing from the work of someone named Dr. Michael Lynn Cruz, who's currently a professor at Regent University in Virginia in 2014. He wrote a paper summarizing all everything that he found in what is called the Whitliff Collection at Texas State University. Um, Cormac McCarthy donated all of his notes, correspondences, um, extra manuscripts to this collection at Texas State in the Alkek Library, and this is in San Marcos, Texas. Um, and Cruz essentially plumbed the depths in that material and uh, looked for direct references to great works of literature or great authors uh, with, re with reference to Blood Meridian. I think he did it with Blood Meridian in particular because it is such an informed book. Um, the list of actual authors, let me see how many are here, probably 40 authors or so. Um, it's a very comprehensive book, and I don't think anyone's ready for there to be so many influences to one book. Um, and so I'm going to go through three of them that I find are most pertinent to the book itself. These three are Lord Byron, the poet, Oswald Spengler, who is a uh, historian and philosopher, and Herman Melville, who is the author of Moby Dick, a very famous book. Um, that you may have had to read in high school, hopefully not. Um, we're actually going to start with Lord Byron um, because it kind of he kind of gives us a road into Blood Meridian uh, that's almost a little bit organic. Oswald Spengler is mainly dry, uh, deriving his work from Nietzsche, from Goethe, and things like that. He's a bit more of a, an ideas person, but his work is extremely influential on the 20th century, primarily philosophers. Um, and also just the way we conceive of the modern world and the modern era. He wrote about technology. He wrote about what we call the decline of the West, which is not as pessimistic as it sounds. Um, and his ideas are really embodied in Blood Meridian. And finally, um, Herman Melville, uh, I believe Cormac McCarthy might have mentioned in his famous books are made from books, quote, um, Moby Dick probably had a large influence on this book. And I think anyone who reads it kind of gets this idea right away. It's about the protagonist going on this journey rather than being uh, at sea. He's in the, the, the desert, essentially, in Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, uh, let's see. This discussion will try to be about an hour just to be square. So it's not too long. But, you know, people can 
listen to it at work or whatever. I believe it's going to be recorded. If it's not, that's embarrassing. <laughs> so very quickly, uh, Cormac McCarthy was born in New England, but he grew up in Tennessee. His father was a lawyer. Um, they had, I believe, help in the house. They had nannies or something. McCarthy wanted to distance himself from this kind of affluent upbringing. He spent most of his early life kind of living in shacks and living on a boat. And he traveled to Spain at one point. Um, when he wrote Orchard Keeper in the late 60s, uh, it was incredibly received. He won uh, the Faulkner Award for notable new novels. He refused to do lectures on his own books because uh, he would tell people, or rather his ex-wife said, he would say, uh, it's all on the page. There's nothing else to describe. Now, saying it's all on the page is going to be very important for considering and thinking about McCarthy, and we're going to remember it throughout this talk. Um, McCarthy wrote uh, Orchard Keeper, Outer Dark, and Child of God in the 60s and 70s. He wrote a book called Sutri, which is in many ways like a sister novel to Blood Meridian. He was kind of, as we, as we see in the Cruz paper, he was going through the same motions. And in fact, there are very similar ideas, particularly at the end of Sutri, that resonate directly with Blood Meridian, um, particularly in a, a Spenglerian way, as we will look at. Um, in 1981, uh, and by the way, he was he, he is already a literary celebrity at this point. His books don't sell particularly well, but he's awarded and people know who he is. Saul Bellow and Shelby Foote. Uh, a famous historian, recommend him to the MacArthur Foundation, and Cormac McCarthy gets a grant. Um, he, and this is in 1981, between then and 1985, when Blood Meridian was published, he traveled through the Chihuahua Desert, and he wrote Blood Meridian, he says, in a shack behind a shopping mall or something, that he said was barely habitable. Um, he's famous for traveling with a light bulb so that he can screw it in wherever he goes so he can read. Um, and he travels around with a famous typewriter that sometimes he would blow out at the gas station. Uh, he, he had a very bohemian life. Um, and in spite of that, managed to create some of the most iconic literature in American history. So now we arrive at Blood Meridian. He is inspired by the Mexican-American War. Manifest Destiny is the stage on which all of this is happening. Is it integral to the plot? Yes, in many ways, but we kind of say bye-bye to Manifest Destiny early in the book, um, especially after uh, we meet and depart with the character Captain White. But before I get ahead of myself, we're going to start with Byron, like I mentioned. Um, Cruz finds a reference to Byron in a letter from Cormac McCarthy. I don't think it says to whom from 1981. So this is the Blood Meridian era. Sutri has been published. He's moving on to a new work of literature. All he does here is mention Byron. That's really all we need, um, which Cruz says is not surprising. Lord Byron is one of the most famous poets of all time, and McCarthy frequents classic literary avenues. So Cruz quotes McCarthy as writing in a letter, quote, I don't know if I agree about writers being the only dependable readers, I remember reading once the names of the writers Byron admired, none of whom anyone has heard of since. And we will be returning to this idea again. The, just the, the idea that uh, writers' names are lost is visited upon in the first page of Blood Meridian. Um, all we need to know is that McCarthy knew who Byron was and derived inspiration from him. And I think the connection will be almost indisputable in the next few moments. Um, but I, McCarthy definitely knew who Byron was. He's a very famous writer. McCarthy uh, worshipped classic writers. Um, Byron is famous for having an anti-hero, maybe inventing the anti-hero. I'm not sure. That's kind of a Don Quixote thing and stuff. Um, let's see, blah, blah, blah. Byron traveled a lot and he made a great impression on cultural in his culture in his day. Um, his poetry is authoritative, full-bodied, and existential, so very McCarthyan, or rather McCarthy is very Byronian. Um, among his most famous works is a poem called Stanzas to the Poe. Uh, Byron was in Italy at this time, uh, close to the end of his life, actually. He was in love with a married woman named Teresa Gamba Gazelli. His infatuation was so intense that it would follow him to his grave. Gazelli was brilliant, sociable, and in many ways, a celebrity in Venice, I believe, where they hang out. 
Um, they eloped in 1821, grew bored, and then Byron left for Greece, where he would die a few years later. Um, Stanzas to the Poe was composed in 1819, I think when the affair was kind of blossoming. He confronts the river Poe itself as a kind of council, and um, he felt affirmed in his romantic ambitions. In the 11th verse, he writes, A stranger loves the lady of the land born far beyond the mountains, but his blood is all meridian, as if never fanned by the black wind that chills the polar flood. A very interesting combination of words here. Byron was a man who was controlled by his extraordinary vision of the natural world, controlled by his passions and a slave to beauty in every sense. And it is this obsession with what is beautiful that will feature centrally in Blood Meridian. Um, but the beauty itself may be a fact of the human will and perhaps not a remark about the world itself. Um, now, the idea of blood being meridian, of course, the highest point, that doesn't just mean high blood pressure. That means in the most excited state and possibly in the completion of the human idea. It's going to be an important thing to remember. As soon as you open up the book, you have three epigraphs, which we're going to briefly go over. The first one is from a man named Paul Valéry, who is a French statesman and writer. He wrote short stories and poems. Um, his short stories were very interesting. Um, the one in the epigraph here is from a story called On the Yalu. It's about a apparently European narrator who is in China um, along, I believe, the Yangtze River. And he's talking to his friend on the banks of the river, or rather on the beach at the mouth of the river. The friend who is Chinese says, oh, very soon the Japanese will come in here. It'll be catastrophic and so on and so on. I think it's, he's talking about the 19th century or, you know, a time when this would be relevant. I don't think it was happening um, in his lifetime because it, was, it would be much more horrific. <laughs> he was alive in the first half of the 20th century when warfare in China was kind of, um, you wouldn't have time to sit around and write about it. And the European man, the narrator, kind of talks about, oh, man, that's terrible. The Chinese man then goes on this rant where he kind of harangues Western culture as being weak-willed and being led astray by their inventions. Um, the Chinese man says, and this is the paragraph right before the epigraph in on the Yalu. The Chinese friend says, for you, intelligence is not one thing among many. That means it's the main thing. And that seems to be the West's mistake. He says, quote, every day it devours everything. It would like to put an end to a new state of society every morning. A man intoxicated on it believes his own thoughts are legal decisions or facts in themselves, born of the crowd in time. He confuses his quick changes of, changes of heart with imperceptible variation of real forms and enduring beings. This is the law by which the intelligence despises law, and you encourage its violence. You are in love with intelligence until it frightens you, for your ideas are terrifying and your hearts are faint. Your acts of pity and cruelty are absurd, committed with no calm, as if they were irresistible. Finally, you fear blood more and more, blood and time. It's as if basing your actions purely on intelligence is a mistake, as if intelligence is just a, an organ. It's just a part of us. The Chinese man is saying that there's more to it than just being smart and just using your brain. He goes on to say that, for example, one human life is just one among many in the great river of the species. Um, if one dies in warfare, it doesn't matter because they did it dying for those who came before them and those who will succeed him. He rationalizes violence and also war in many different ways um, and what, to the point where it's almost naturalistic. Then the crime seems to be to consider war unnatural or strange, which intelligence, uh, as, we, as he says, um, acts under intelligence, acts of pity and cruelty are absurd, as if they should be taken wholesale, like pity and cruelty, you should invest in them in their own right. You shouldn't have to justify them off intelligence, or they shouldn't derive from an intelligent decision. That would make it almost cruel in, in, a, in, in a whole new fashion. Um, and again, he uh, he kind of suggests that Western ideals improperly conflate our whims with law itself. To him, war and blood are mere facts of life, a matter of business. He continues to harangue the visitor, a European, European for his fear of blood and his obsession with revolution and constant change um, to the point where a change of heart, as he says, is, is just too catastrophic. You have to be 
acting in a larger in a larger picture, essentially. But of course, Valeri himself was a Westerner, so it's really a Westerner haranguing the West as being, in a way, weak-willed, incapable of discerning things that are old hat to other and more ancient civilizations. I think he chose China because it's considered the oldest continuous major civilization. I believe the oldest are the Aborigines in Australia, like 40,000 years, but whatever. China had walls longer, I guess. Uh, this would invite the reader to reconsider their squeamishness and be on alert for entities that might lead us astray by taking hold of our naivete. Again, an individual guided by intelligence can be manipulated in a blink of an eye. Um, if you simply give them the correct input, they will act essentially on impulse, as we will see in the first chapter of Blood Meridian. The next um, quote in the epigraph comes from Jacob Baim, Baim, I think, Baim, I'll just call him. Uh, he lived from 1575 until 1624. He was a Lutheran theologian and a mystic. He wrote very prolifically, uh, even though he was essentially working class. I think he was just a, a farmer who was possessed with these, uh, this Christian ideation. He is very influential to um, Enlightenment era philosophers in Germany like Goethe and Hegel. Um, and he helped inspire, for example, German idealism and romanticism, which were huge in um, the early 19th century. And that came about within a few decades of the start of Blood Meridian. Bema was sometimes seen as heretical in his lifetime, and his genius was not really recognized until the very end of his life. He was actually what we'd call working class, as I said, but he still had command of theological rhetoric. Interestingly, he believed that Adam and Eve's expulsion from paradise was necessary in the formation of the world. This was not a popular view at the time, but it illustrates his singular voice, and it's an element to understanding blood meridian, as if the fall was somehow a part of our salvation. Incredible. Um, the epigraph itself comes from his work, Six Theosophic Points, and each part of this work is divided into articles or points. Um, he discusses the nature of darkness and evil. He quotes Christ as saying in John 8, 44, the devil is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Uh, he describes all forms as being in a state of adversity with one another within the darkness, um, which is kind of this, this evil or this state of corruption or poison, as he calls it. Each of them is a figure of deception. They're all concealing what they really are. And this is going to be very important. He says darkness is terrified of light, even though light seems to exist within each dark form, each concealed form. So although we are trying to conceal things from other people, there's still a light within us that I imagine will be related to fire or some kind of inner flame. A dark form is a shapeshifter and can take on many forms. Part 11 reads, the dark life is like a terror where the flash and terror is always mounting upwards as if it would quit the life and fly out above it. And hence arises pride so that the devil is always wishing to be above God. It is his proprium or his trait or characteristic. His life's figure is so, and he cannot do otherwise, just as a poison rages and pierces, as if it would break loose from the member. So the darkness is like a poison that's trying to come out, uh, yeah, almost like a worm, like a chest burster or something. Um, and it's something that has to be got out. It's almost like causing us to behave in a certain way. Um, the translation that I found differs slightly from McCarthy, but I think it sheds even more light on what Jacob Bama is trying to say. And yet it is not to be thought that the life of darkness therefore sinks down into misery, that it would forget itself as if it were sorrowful. There is no sorrowing. But what with us on earth is sorrowing, according to this property, is in the darkness power and joy according to the property of the darkness for sorrowfulness is a thing that is swallowed up in death but death and dying is the life of the darkness just as anguish is the life of the poison and the greater the anguish becomes in the poison the stronger it becomes the poison life as it is to be seen in the external poison so what he's saying that here on earth we believe in good and so these terrible things are considered horrible. But in darkness, in the state of sin or deception and falsehood, it's just 
daily life. There's going to be a scene in the first chapter in which we are in a state of sorrow. Something sad is happening, if you would. Um, and yet no one has a sorrowful reaction to what happens, even though it is an atrocity. But we'll get there. Uh, the final epigraph is from, as McCarthy writes, the Yuma Daily Sun, which is a newspaper, I guess, in Arizona, uh, published June 13th, 1982. This is very interesting. Uh, it says that uh, they found a skull that was 300,000 years old. Tim D. White found it, uh, a colleague uh, uh, at UC Berkeley. Uh, shows evidence of having been scalped. This, I believe, refers to what is called the Bodo cranium, which is a fossil from an extinct hominid. Uh, it was found in 1976, and a member of the McCarthy Forums named Glass, uh, posting in 2015, said that the Bodo cranium is actually 600,000 years old, not 300,000, as reported in the newspaper. So it's doubling McCarthy's point that this act of ritualistic violence extends long before civilization ever came about by a dizzy, dizzying margin. Um, now, we're going to essentially go to the first page. I would like to leave everything we've talked about there because in Blood Meridian, it really is just they're throwing details at us. There's something new happening all the time and you have to keep moving past these things that are full of meaning. So we'll just do the first page or rather the first three paragraphs, depending on how your copy is printed. Um, and we'll focus on this intensively, but I think one reason why it's so hard to get into this book is because to truly appreciate it, you'd have to stop every 50 words and really think about it. We're gonna focus on the first page of chapter one and go through all the relevant information. here. <coughs> the first page reads, See the child. He is pale and thin. He wears a thin and ragged linen shirt. He stokes the scullery fire. Outside lie dark turned fields with rags of snow in darker woods beyond that harbor yet a few last wolves. His folk are known for hewers of wood and drawers of water, but in truth his father has been a schoolmaster. He lies and drink. He quotes from poets whose names are now lost. The boy crouches by the fire and watches him. Night of your birth, 33. The Leonids, they were called. God, how those stars did fall. I looked for blackness, holes in the heavens, the dipper stove. The mother dead these 14 years did incubate in her own bosom the creature who would carry her off. The father never speaks her name. The child does not know it. He has a sister in this world that he will not see again. He watches pale and unwashed. He can neither read nor write, and in him broods already a taste for mindless violence. All history present in that visage, the child, the father of the man. There's, as they say, a lot to unpack here. The last line in these paragraphs, the child, the father of the man, comes from a poem by Wordsworth called My Heart Leaps Up, and it goes, My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So was it when my life began, so is it now I am a man. So be it when I shall grow old, or let me die. The child is the father of the man, and I wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. This is a poem about someone who cannot let go of their childlike wonder at the world. They would like to hold on to this childishness, or they'd rather die without it. Um, the child is the father of the man. Essentially, the child creates what he will later become. And in fact, this childlike wonder dominates him. He, he can't see past it, and he would like his days to be bound each to each in natural piety. So piety to the natural world and to nothing else. This is someone who is beholden to nature, and they would like to channel nature through themselves, almost as kind of an immoral act but we're going to see that there are natural and there are um, almost primordial ways of approaching nature that are perhaps um, antagonistic to what we consider civilization or culture or simply uh, common decency. Now in these first paragraphs, we have a child who lives in a very destitute fashion. His uh, mother died during childbirth. Uh, this is very important. He never met his mother because he technically killed his mother by being born. 
His father used to be a schoolmaster, but this child cannot read. The father has not conferred knowledge onto this child. The child um, resents his father. He says the boy crouches by the fire and watches him like some kind of feral dog. The professor or the schoolmaster, the father, seems to talk about the night of his birth, which was 1833 during a Leonid shower in November of that year. Uh, just all of these, you can just see all these meteors filling the sky and falling down towards the horizon. And the image of this massive river of stars falling down upon the black horizon will be revisited multiple times in this book. In fact, it will end the book as well. And so this idea that all stars will reach their arc and then they will fall back down towards the horizon once they came from obscurity and into obscurity. And yet there will be some or rather one character who will not suffer the same fate. So he is apparently among the Leonids or he was descended from the Leonids. Um, and then these last lines, he can neither read nor write and in him broods already a taste for mindless violence. So this is mindless violence for no particular reason. He can neither read nor write. And so the meaning of the natural world is hidden from him. He doesn't have insight or curiosity in it. He's simply acting. He's simply a creature upon the landscape. This is crucial to understanding the kid himself. People try to say, oh, he's an allegory for, um, he might be an empty vessel. He might just be a almost silent protagonist. He might just be a pair of eyes. I think he has total, um, I think he has a narrative within him. I think there is a lot going on within him that you simply don't, uh, that is not explicitly addressed. Everything that happens in the book, I think, is a transformation of his personality as it uh, unfolds. Observing violence, being um, cast out from society, losing um, brotherhood with one group and coming in with another. I think it all has an effect on him without being explicitly addressed. Continuing on, he leaves home one day, apparently on his own two feet. Um, he will never, as it says, stoke the scullery fire again. He travels to Memphis, Tennessee, where he observes African-Americans picking cotton in a field, lank and stooped, their fingers spider-like among the bowls of cotton. Spengler will later talk about how once great people will be marginalized. For example, cities like Athens, Florence, even in, in the early 20th century, they're not glorious or incredible anymore. Even though they're considered these classical world cities, they're, they're just a bunch of grubby apartments now. I mean, Athens, I haven't been there, but it looks beautiful. Everyone tells me it's, I mean, it's just the same as any city now. And that's kind of how it is. People get pushed to the side. They will kind of lose their luster. They're kind of become side characters uh, throughout history. This is going to be descriptive of the arc of everyone you meet and of civilization itself. Spengler wrote The Decline of Civilization. Um, and when he wrote Decline in German, it's Untergang, which is almost like a going under. It's not necessarily like it's, um, this is all over, everyone go home. Just the project itself, like an organism, will expire one day. He nearly chose the word uh, Wollendung, which is completion or is being finished. What is being completed and has a perfect form been attained or is it something dying? There is a character in this book who will assert that it is possibly both at the same time. A year later, he's in St. Louis. He goes to New Orleans, 42 days on the river, 42. I don't, there's probably meaning that. <laughs> I know a lot about this book. He becomes a pugilist. He fights with sailors. He's not big, but he has big wrists. Um, his shoulders are set close. The child's face is curiously untouched behind the scars. The childishness is maintained behind this mindless violence. As long as the violence is almost playful, uh, it's almost like you're stuck in the loop of being a child. It's this childlike energy that is prevailing and persistent. Eventually he gets shot by a Maltese boatswain um, who shoots him with a small pistol. He is nursed back to health um, by a tavern keeper's wife. Uh, he has no money at all to pay her. He just leaves one day and then takes a boat to Texas. 
And that's pretty much all we hear about the background of the kid before the story starts. And this is only, we're only up to the third page of the actual narrative. McCarthy throws in the section here that is the narrator speaking to us. And what's amazing about this book is even from the per first page, when he starts with the words, see the child, McCarthy is not like most authors where he's sitting across the table and saying, I'm going to tell you about some people or some things that happen. It's like McCarthy is right here at our shoulder from the very beginning. And he says, see this child. This is happening. Then this happens to him. And then he turns to us. He like grabs our face and says, only now is the child finally divested of all that he has been. His origins are become remote as his destiny and not again in all the world's turning will there be terrain so wild and barbarous to try whether the stuff of creation may be shaped to man's will or whether his own heart is not another kind of clay. So now the kid has grown remote from his origins. This violence that he has suffered has transformed him in every way. Um, and he's just a completely new person now. His destiny is also in flux. We're not sure if he's going to become the master of his destiny or if he will be, again, subordinated by something. And it will, and again, there will not be terrain so insane as to test whether or not the human will will have power over the natural world or if the human being or the human heart will simply become an aspect of it. We're looking at the difference between mastering the natural world or being subordinated by it, subjugated. Uh, as we have already seen subjugated people, there are people on the boat, he continues, who are a diffident lot. They cage their eyes and no man asks another what it is that brings him here. They have no curiosity about the past. Nobody cares what's happening. They're just moving forward. They're almost looking at each other with beady eyes. They're like animals. And he immediately goes into the description of birds on the shore. He sleeps on the deck, a pilgrim, a pilgrim among others. He watches the dim shore rise and fall. Gray seabirds gawking, flights of pelicans coastwise above the gray swells. Creatures who are a part of the natural order swirling around them, almost like vultures or something. Um, essentially coaxing him or teasing him about, about what his destiny will become. Now, what happens, and again, there's all this description of the birds, egrets, and their rookeries, white as candles among the moss. Um, my goodness, dead people in a town square. He goes to Nacogdoches, which is a um, town in East Texas. I believe it also represented what they called the meridian or the border to the Wild West, or rather the disputed territories at this time in history. Might have been a direct reference to a blood meridian. We now go to Nacogdoches, where there is a reverend hosting a revival in a big tent. His name is Reverend Green. He's been there for two weeks, and rain had been falling for a very long time. So he's been doing this since long before the kid gets here. The kid goes in and hears him preaching about how you should not go into, as he says, yonder hellhole, because Christ is walking beside you. Essentially, if you are going to do these sinful things, just remember that Christ is here with you. So what would he think about all this? And um, the kid is kind of standing there listening. Um, and then a man comes in, uh, described as a teamster with a mustache, who says, you ever see such a place for rain as if it's misplaced? Um, and he's talking about have you ever seen uh, this much rain in Nacogdoches or in uh, Texas? The kid says, I just got here. The guy says, well, it beats all I ever seen. So there's all this rain. I mean, it's just such a, almost like a sorrowing, if you would, based on what Jacob Bamis said. The kid nodded. And then an, an enormous man dressed in an oilcloth slick, slicker had entered the tent and removed his hat. He was bald as a stone and he had no trace of beard and he had no brows to his eyes nor lashes to them. He was close on to seven feet in height and he stood smoking a cigar even in this nomadic house of God. And he seemed to have removed his hat only to chase the rain from it. For now he put it on again. This huge pale hairless man will later be described as the judge. He is a central character in this book. This is the first time the kid encounters him. 
Um, Tobin, I believe, a later character will describe how everyone uh, in the group of scalpers has seen the judge at some point. Um, and the kid, obviously, this is his uh, moment. The judge walks to the front of the congregation and almost naturally gets everyone everyone's attention. He then uh, announces that the reverend behind him has been accused of having Congress with a child and with a goat. Um, the reverend is flipping through the Bible saying, no, that can't be true. He's trying to get attention back to himself. But the judge is just issuing these accusations. People just get incredibly angry, pull out their guns and just descend on the reverend. And as things are really heating up, the teamster pulls out a knife, cuts a hole in the tent, and he and the kid escape together. Almost like it's such a almost explicit illustration just here's the arena that we're in this tent guided by christianity and this guy comes in and says no this guy is is, is a pedophile and he's a fraud um and then uh the two people who are uh, the kid and his friend they cut a hole in the side of the tent they almost pier they literally pierce the veil and get out of there behind them there are gunshots the reverend is assumed to be killed and the tent collapses essentially on top of everyone or behind everyone fleeing. And then um, they all meet at a bar and the judge is buying everyone drinks. This is the first time he's referred to as the judge. And people are like, how do you know Reverend Green? Uh, the judge says, I have never met him in my life and I've never heard of him. Everyone hesitates quickly and or briefly rather. And they just kind of look at each other in what he calls a strange silence. And the men, he says, look like mud effigies. Finally, someone began to laugh, then another. Soon they, will all, they were all laughing together. Someone bought the judge a drink. They hesitate because they think about how, like, well, we just killed that guy. And it was, it was completely false. So what do we do on this day that's raining like no other? which almost is an indication that it's it's a tragic, it's a sorrowful day. Now that they are implicated, now that they have been manipulated into this, what do they do? They laugh at what they've done. It's almost like the judge has forced them into this impasse and they choose to take the road in which they're making light of this reverend's death, this innocent man's death. Um, and again, like what um, Jacob Bema quoted in John, the devil is a liar and a murderer off the bat. And that's the first impression we get of the, we get of the judge. It's literally two paragraphs. It's just, here's what he looks like and here's what he does. He manipulates a crowd, a crowd of credulous people into murdering a reverend. Again, the dangers of prioritizing intelligence and prioritizing your ideas and your own precepts, like Paul Valeri mentioned in the epigraph. Um, acts of pity and cruelty are absurd because they're misplaced, because it was a lie. And also, let's say this guy did do all of this. The fact that they just jumped on top of him right away shows how stupid intelligence can be. Um, and let's say, okay, it had been raining for 16 days when he met Toad Vine. So the kid has stayed in Nacogdoches. He gets into an altercation with a man where he kicks him in the face because he doesn't want to move out of the way. There's a brawl. A man slams the kid in the head with a giant log. He wakes up with Toadvine looking down on him. Toadvine is a character with no ears and I believe dreadlocks. And he has tattoos. Uh, H-T, which would be horse thief, and then F, which I believe means that he escaped from jail, I believe. Um, Toadvine essentially pulls him out of the mud where he, had, where he almost suffocated. Um, and then he just enlists him to help him assault uh, a man in a hotel to death. They run into this tavern. They set a fire under his door. So he wakes up as he opens the door. They just beat the living hell out of him, beat him to death and gouge his eye out. I'm sorry. They run out of there. The building catches on fire. They scramble. Essentially the kid gets his mule back. And as he's going by the tavern again, there are people standing around with what he, with what McCarthy calls empty buckets. They can't put it out. They have no way to stop this trend, this 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 raising of this of this establishment. And as he's leaving town, he sees the judge smiling at him, very very telling. And he and he headed. He continued on west. 
this is one hell of an opening chapter. And we go from the heart of Tennessee that is slowly being corrupted by this, you know, uh, this winter, you know, strand rags of snow haunted by a few last wolves um, to uh, all through America and then to Nagadoches, where there's this, this confounding event. Very dense, and I don't blame people for simply being dizzy at this point. Um, moving on. Oh, man, I should have scrolled all past this. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, that's the end of the first chapter. So, at this point, if you don't want any more of the book to be spoiled, uh, you can go ahead and turn this off. But if you've already read Blood Meridian and you just want more insight into it, this is where we're going to start it. We've got about 20 more minutes technically on the hour. I might go a little bit over. What I'd like to do is get as much of the uh, discussion in as possible. We're going to move on to um, Oswald Spengler. Now, before we even do that, we have to talk about Goethe and we have to talk about Faust. Um, the judge says at one point in the book, and by the way, everyone, if you haven't read it, turn it off now because I'm just going to spoil the hell out of the book. Michael Cruz talks about Oswald Spengler um, in, uh, based on a quote from Cormac McCarthy from Blood Meridian. I'm getting lost here which I think I've got it right here. In fact, I need to look at my stupid notes. Yes. During the chapter where Tobin recounts encountering the judge in the desert when they're being chased by the Comanches, and then the judge creates gunpowder. Um, Tobin says that when they are in the Malpe there, Malpais, uh, the judge gets up and gives a sermon, which he can't really recount word by word. But within this sermon, he recounts, um, beyond the Malpais was a volcanic peak, and in the sunrise there was many colors, and there was a there was dark little birds crossing down the wind, and the wind was flapping the judge's old Benjamin about on him. And he pointed to that stark and solitary mountain and delivered himself an oration to what end I know not, I know not, then or now, and he concluded with the telling us that our mother, the earth, as he said, was round like an egg and contained all good things within her. Then he turned and led the horse he had been riding across that terrain of black and glassy slag, treacherous to man and beast alike, and us behind him like the disciples of a new faith. This is obviously referencing um, Paradise Lost, Satan guiding people to essentially take materials out of the earth in order to, I mean, the invention of warfare, and the invention of gunpowder. I, I mean, you know, iron, it could be the sword, it could be bronze. Um, and so that's essentially what that's representing. Oswald Spengler uh, directly describes the earth as being like an egg. It's precious, but eventually it's going to be broken in a way. And it's whether or not we're going to honor the preciousness or simply break it open and access what is valuable inside of it. And um, I mean, that's what we see here. The, the judge is described as being egg-like, I believe, in the final chapter. It, you know, he takes his hat off and he looks like, I believe it's called an iridescent or a phosphorescent egg. Again, the phosphorescence would be in reference to <laughs> making gunpowder. Um, and so uh, this is also going to be in reference. So hard to get it all straight to the concept of the will to power, which is crucial in Blood Meridian, as we will find out. Um, McCarthy was a, uh, he read Spengler very closely. I believe he has said in interviews, he's referenced Spengler as being an, an influence. Um, the will to power originally actually comes from Schopenhauer, who coined the idea of the will to live to describe biological motivations. Interestingly, Schopenhauer held that the will itself is the most important, even more than our sense of safety or of um, um, material gain or a very concept of existence because the will somehow exists without acknowledgement of either. The will transcends everything, no matter how you put it. And that will kind of be the theme between the will to live and what Nietzsche will later call the will to power. Um, and Nietzsche 
uh, originally read Schopenhauer, I believe in the 1860s, if my Wikipedia memory is good. And he adapted this to many different ideas, um, mainly in the gay science, but also in a few other publications because Nietzsche often wrote these pieces that were kind of bits. They were almost like these mini stories or these mini messages. Um, there was one uh, story he wrote called The Herder. It says the herder fails to be all that he has made people think he was and he himself wished to think he was. He was no great thinker or discoverer, no newly fertile soil with the unexhausted strength of a virgin forest, but he possessed in the highest degree the power of scenting the future. He saw and picked the first fruits of the season earlier than all the others, and they then believed that he had made them grow between darkness and light, youth and age. His mind was like a hunter on the watch looking everywhere for transitions, depressions, convulsions, the outward and visible signs of internal growth. The unrest of spring drove him to and fro, but he was himself not the spring. So this is the first time we see this idea of power and trying to convince people that he is who he was. He is who he is. Um, in the gay science, under item 13, he has something called On the Doctrine of Feeling Power. Uh, he says, benefiting and hurting others are ways of exercising one's power over them. That is all one wants in such cases. We hurt those to whom we need to make our power perceptible for pain is a much more sensitive means to that end than pleasure. Pain always asks for the cause while the pleasure is inclined to stop with itself and not look back. Inflicting pain, we do it and we never wanna look back. This should be immediately relevant to the first chapter where they kill this reverend but then they say, like, well, you know, I guess it's over then, and we did it. Are we going to look back in sorrow? No, whatever. We have a position of power now. This is the will to power, not being inhibited by the circumstances, but simply attaining this, this idea of power through the will, because it's something that we want. Um, whereas those who feel pain, they look for a reason. And I mean, you know, as he says here, there is no reason except this uh to be free of the need to look for reason. Um, and so that's kind of how we view it, is those who are in a position of inflicting it, they tend to be unconscious of it, whereas the ones who are very conscious are the victims. And so obviously in history, there are people who do not want to be a victim. They're going to take the um, position of power or at least seek it almost as a refuge from having to contemplate the tragedies of history. He concludes by saying, compassion is the most agreeable feeling for those who have little pride and no prospect of great conquests. For them, easy prey, and that is what those who suffer are, is something enchanting. Compassion is praised as the virtue of prostitutes. So you only have compassion if you don't have any plans. Looking around and observing just how painful and destructive the world is, is not something indicative of power. Um, uh, someone who is seeking power is, as uh, some people say, is going to step over blood. Nietzsche was an admirer of Dostoevsky. He called Dostoevsky one of the only people, or I think the only person from whom he's ever learned about psychology. Um, he was taken by Crime and Punishment, uh, in which uh, Raskolnikov, the protagonist, is trying to attain Again, this extraordinary status, almost like Napoleon, by stepping over blood, by ignoring violence that he actually commits against a usurer, a moneylender. Um, he believes that it's mere arithmetic to take this moneylender out of the picture, take her money, and she's going to do something good with it. I believe support his family or do something charitable. He talks himself into it, and then he does it, and he has a the punishment, if you will, is having to contemplate this and bear the moral burden of it. So you can either have a will to power in which you are an unthinking son of a bitch who is just killing people and moving forward, or you can contemplate compassion and kind of rescind all of your power. As Spengler says, um, grace in the absence of strength. And this is what McCarthy actually writes in his notes. He quotes Spengler saying, grace in the absence of strength, I believe in decline of the West. Um, and this can be immediately found in Nietzsche. Compassion is only for people who cannot commit violence, 
Um, only those who seek power must be able to dehumanize themselves and commit violence without regret, without looking back. You cannot have both at once. This is the dilemma of the kid. He is observing these things. He is acting mercifully. Um, as Paul Valeri says, he is acting cruelly and mercifully almost in the same breath. And it's absurd. Because if your priority is making sense of things, uh, prioritizing intelligence, it's always going to be absurd. Choose one or the other. Either go to war, kill people and don't look back, or simply don't do it and try to find compassion. And it is by rescinding the will to power that the kid, if you will, fades into the darkness at the end, uh, as opposed to the judge who is always looking to uh, <laughs> will himself to power. Um, by never, he, he has no compassion. He kills children. He scalps people. You know, he's breaking open everyone's egg and taking what they have inside of him. Um, compassion is praised as the virtue of prostitutes, almost telling for the final chapter of Blood Meridian, or the final few paragraphs, in fact. Um, the concept of will to power uh, Vila, uh, Vila Zomacht, I believe, comes from Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Zarathustra is a story about a hermit of that name um, who was in, he was sequestered himself for like a century. He comes out to learn that God has died. He travels to a nearby town and finds people witnessing a spectacle. I think it's a guy in a tightrope. And he tells them that now that God is gone, they have to kind of appoint an overman or ubermensch to claim this position, to kind of take his spot. They scorn him for his views. Uh, he states that people must be willing to die in order to allow this Ubermensch to succeed. Uh, eventually there's an accident. The man on the type roll falls to his death. Oh, everyone runs away screaming. Only the hermit has any concern for this dead guy. He takes his body and hides it in a tree in the woods and vows to never mix with crowds again. I mean, just reading it out loud, it sounds like the first chapter of Blood Meridian in many ways. This, this reverend is killed by this crowd. It's as if the crowd turned on him. Uh, but instead, I mean, they literally killed him. You know? They turned on his humanity. Uh, later on, the hermit has a vision in which he conceives of this will to power. I think this might be one of the first times we see the actual phrase in um, Nietzsche's writing. It's an elusive concept. What is it exactly? We're not sure, but he... Um, identifies it and illustrates it through examples. Nietzsche writes, the ignorant, to be sure, the people, they are like a river on which a boat floateth along, and in the boat sit the estimates of value, solemn and disguised. Um, it's almost like um, ignorant people. Uh, they have these um, strange and amorphous ideas of solemnity and compassion or est estimates of value that they can't really describe. Um, the river reminds me of Byron, There's always with a river, and especially the Leonids falling down, lots of things moving forward with the flow of history. Um, and thus spoke Zarathustra, rather than trying to fit the will into a mechanistic scheme of biological motivations, he simply asserts that the will to power transcends all other motivations, even the will to survive. Um, the qualifying characteristic of the will to power, because it seems like a vague idea, even as I describe it. What gives it distinction is the idea that human beings who are rational and intelligent will risk our lives and do stupid things in order to attain something, usually a position of power or to get into political office or something. In this case, in Blood Meridian, there's people going out in, into the desert, braving armies and braving um, um, these hostile locals in order to make a buck scraping the skin off the top of people's skulls. I mean, it's, it's not rational, but people do it. They do it because they have intelligence and they can glimpse a horizon beyond just the, you know, fear and pain. It transcends everything and will even transcends intelligence. And this is a very difficult place to be in, in blood burning. And the kid would like to make sense of these things. He would like to rationalize what is happening. The will is completely separate from intelligence. And like the character in the Paul Valeri story says, the Chinese man on the banks of the Yalu, um, he, uh, uh, intelligence is just one part of many. Um, the will transcends all of this. What do you want? Um, uh, Nietzsche writes, 
that to the stranger, the weaker shall serve. Like he says, in the beginning with the Ubermensch, thereto persuadeth he his will, who would be master over a still weaker one. That delight alone he is unwilling to forego. People must let the strong ascend in their place. And as the lesser surrendereth himself to the greater, that he may have delight and power over the least of all, so doth even the greatest surrender himself, and staketh life for sake of power. So the greatest among us will risk everything in the pursuit of power. Um, and it transcends the concept of good and evil, as Nietzsche writes about. And here we see a, an idea almost paraphrased by the judge at one point in the book. Verily I say unto you, good and evil, which would be everlasting, it doth not exist. Of its own accord must it ever surpass itself anew. With your values and formulae of good and evil, Ye exercise power, ye valuing ones, and that is your secret love and the sparkling, trembling, and overflowing of your souls. And so uh, it, it exceeds in all of our estimates and our metrics. Uh, but a stronger power groweth out of your values and a new surpasseth it. By it breaketh egg and eggshell. Eggshells are directly referenced in Tobin's recalling of first meeting the judge about the horses are almost riding across this landscape of eggshells because it's very uh, treacherous. And then, of course, breaking open the ground and taking its contents out, uh, breaking the egg, if you would. Um, you have to make an omelet one way or another. Um, and again, the judge is described as being round and pale and, you know, he himself is an egg. It's almost like an egg that uh, uh, eludes breaking, if you would. And he who hath to be a creator in good and evil, verily he hath first to be a destroyer and break values in pieces. So as we see in the first chapter, and as the judge harangues us over and over again, values are worth nothing. Um, he almost seems to understand the character in Paul Valeri's story. We're like, this is all absurd. Um, there's no such thing as values. You have to have a, a will. You have to have an intention one way or another. And now we can finally move on to Spengler. We're almost at the end here, but I'll just keep going. Oswald Spengler, he lived from 1880 to 1936. He was a German philosopher and a scholar. He wrote The Decline of the West in 1922, which is very popular. Um, and uh, he would not live to see the cataclysmic Second World War. And despite initially voting for Hitler, he soon turned around and was ostracized for his opposition to the status quo. Spengler opposed anti-Semitism. He is still known for his general criticism of liberalism among Islamist circles. He mainly criticized liberalism. Um, and his main book, In Decline of the West, Spengler casts a society as a cultural organism that can live and die in intervals and asserts that the Western project is coming to an end. Rather than taking an overtly pessimistic view, however, he acquires Goethe's concept of becoming and changing. The German word again in the title is Untergang or going under, but he wanted to, to use the word Wollendung, which is almost more like a fulfillment or a completion. This probably concerns the judge's ideas directly, the idea that the sunset or twilight of mankind is somehow also the completion of his project. It's essentially an organism arising out of the ashes of the previous one um, in a very sci-fi kind of way. You've probably seen like some creature, you know, anyway. But completion is a complicated reality and not necessarily straightforward. The completion could be a realizing of a warfaring creature or a concession to our nature in a more abstract sense. Um, I don't think there's a straightforward solution to this obscure detail. I, I believe the book simply illustrates that the triumph of the will over all other conventions uh, with violence merely serving as a means to an end uh, is kind of what the judge is saying. I mean, it, the will is ultimately our, our, our uh, the feather in our hat, if you will. Everything else is just happenstance and we will be dragged down essentially into the mud if we neglect our most our greatest strength which is the will willpower um and everything will fall apart civilization we won't believe in that crap anymore um our values our morals it'll all fall to the wayside um in order for this ultimate this over idea or this over concept to take its place the idea of the will 
Um, Spangler discusses Goethe and Nietzsche almost back to back in the beginning of Decline in the West. He describes a classical civilization as a situation uh, of breaks from destiny, successive tangential abstractions from what had come before. The advancements from classical to new, like from Athens to Paris, Aristotle to Kant, Alexander to Napoleon. Um, he, he doesn't find these to be linear or organic advancements. He thinks that the classical world is completely different from the world today, and we don't inherit that uh, classical tradition. He believes the connection is totally aesthetic and superficial. He suggests that it is more productive to identify how alien the classical world really is to us, as if we share anything with people who lived two, 2,000 or 2,500 years ago. But Spengler actually frames Nietzsche as being lost in his idealiz idealization of the classical world and accuses him of speaking to a philological mirror. And rather than just buying into the ancient, medieval, modern theory of history, Spengler believes history occurs more organically as a sequence in which successive iterations do not necessarily resemble past examples or even the immediate antecedent exactly like a transforming organism. Of course, at this point in history, Darwinism and the new theory of evolution is just kind of coming into um, our general conception of uh, nature. So when we see the word evening or sunset or twilight in the subtitle, The Evening Redness in the West, uh, what we are actually observing is at the moment that it is uttered, the product of this historical sequence, when you say uh, right now it is the evening, right now it is the sunset of history, yes, you're looking at an, a going under or a completion of a historical arc, but there will be another one. And what is that one? Um, in the context of Blood Meridian, we are observing a new iteration of history derived not from an original point, because again, we are remote from our origins, but from what has developed in the interim, we must acknowledge what has happened in our actual history, which is not pretty. Um, this gives new meaning to characters being remote from their origins. As I said, it casts light on the kid's abandonment of the poets whose names are now lost. We are breaking from tradition. It's something completely new now that is born out of what has come before, um, but in a way that is not immediately pertinent to these, these um classical or these original elements. Moving west, the human race must become something new, but maybe we are not willing to admit what it is that we must become. Uh, the judge's destruction of artifacts may also serve to drive a wedge between the truth of history and our fallacious inclination to depict history as one long linear narrative. The thread of history, according to Spengler, is frayed and tangential ossification of worldviews may act against our interests. This may be something that the judge is aware of. He may think that there is no history, there is no civilization, and you need to purge this idea from people's minds. I believe, as he says, um, this idea that there was someone there before, that we come from them, or that it's relevant to us at all, is almost ridiculous. Finding the heel of a boot from a Portuguese or Spanish conquistador in the desert, or finding pottery, he notes it in his pad and then destroys it in front of everyone. And they wonder why. We consider the past to be precious. We consider it sacred, but he doesn't believe in any such thing. The idea of something being sacred may be a betrayal or it may be uh, completely misleading for us. Um, Spengler distinguishes also between cultural and zoological determinisms in history. While the West or the concept of the West, which is a cultural construct, may, came, may come to an end, uh, this is trivial in the grand scheme of things. In light of Spengler's book, Man and Technics, however, which does have quite a pessimistic outlook, he warns that whereas culture was previously our focus, soon its moment's slow expiration will give way to the often overlooked technical world, which can, be effort, which can effortlessly replace our sacred concerns with abs with the absolutely mundane. He says that the triumph of the machines will just make things more boring. And this is a violent act. It's terrible. And of course, it will sideline humanity. But what he truly fears is the sacrifice of the soul in exchange for a purely technical life. In Man and Technics, he writes, for in reality, technics is immemorially old. And moreover, it is not something historically specific. 
but something immensely general. It extends far beyond mankind, back into the life of the animals, indeed of all animals. It is distinctive of the animal in contrast to the plant-wise type of living that is capable of moving freely in space and possesses same measure, great or small, of self-will and independence of nature as a whole. And that, in possessing these, it is obliged to maintain itself against nature and to give its own being some sort of significance, some sort of a content, and some sort of superiority. If then we would attach a significance to technics, we must start from the soul and that alone. So again, technics, or this idea of invention or having a method in this world, is ancient. It's a part of our organic being. Um, but uh, we must maintain ourselves against nature, as he says, and we need to give our own being a kind of significance or something there, something to fill the void, if you would, a sense of superiority. Um, and with regard to decline in the West, Spengler is consistent in distinguishing the cultural arc of history from the purely biological, asserting that technique is a hallmark of all life, and it'll be here before and after whatever civilizationary project, whether it's the, um, for example, I mean, the, 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 what is it? The Persians have come and gone. Um, the Rome has come and gone. The Holy Roman Empire is gone. He then issues some startlingly judge-like remarks, again, in Man and Technics. Technics is the tactics of living. It is the inner form of which the procedure of conflict, the conflict that is identical with life itself, is the outward expression. This is the second error that has to be avoided. Technics is not to be understood in terms of the implement. What matters is not how one fashions things, but what one does with them. Not the weapon, but the battle. Modern warfare in which the decisive element is tactics, that is the technique of running the war, the techniques of inventing, producing, and handling the weapons being only terms in the process as a whole, points to a general truth. So it has nothing to do with the invention, with the science, as Jacques Ellul also draws a difference between the science and the technique, as he says. But it's how we use it. It's the way that we do things. And that seems to be what the judge is doing, is coming into this fact of being someone who does things, who takes control of things. And it's almost a failure of the will to say, we need to stop because this is going against our morals. The morals themselves are kind of technique. And so it's about finding a technique that transcends the other ones. That would be slightly more human. But again, is this something that we want? Are we going to continue to allow technique and intelligence to just run rampant? Is this a nature that we want to identify with? And again, the Paul Valeri epigraph talks about how unleashed intelligence is, um, well, look at it. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. The judge is someone who knows everything, who is capable of everything. And in, in many ways, he is um, the, the Faust character. He, is, he may have sold his soul to the devil uh, through a kind of Mephistopheles in exchange for all knowledge or all capability. And regardless of whether you know, he matches this trait or not, both uh, Faust as a character and the judge show that this is kind of what people are doing. They're trying to create a perfectly intelligent civilization, and it's just absurd. It's not something that should exist. And, and again, as I to repeat, unleashed intelligence is terrifying. It commits atrocities, uh, like at the revival tent. Just on a whim, he turned these people against this poor reverend, um, who probably was completely innocent. Spengler's approach to technique is almost frighteningly sober, identifying that our underlying nature is not beholden to ephemeral conceptions, but extends far beyond the narrow horizon of our conceits. As we consider the evening redness in the West, it is helpful to identify that we are coming into a twilight of an era and into a more faithful inheritance of our nature, one that preceded our short-lived projects and will long outlive it. And again, in decline, he notes the marginalization of great cities, people, and cultures, cultures throughout history, how Florence, Rome, Athens hardly command the renown they once did, and that this is typical in history. As he says, that many famous old noble families, descendants of the men who defeated the cults, the Celts and the Samnites, lost their ancestral homes through standing apart from the wild rush of speculation 
and were reduced to renting wretched apartments that while the Appian Way there rose the splendid and still wonderful tombs of the financial magnates, the corpses of the people were thrown along with animal carcasses and town refuse into a monstrous common grave, till in Augustus's time it was banked over for the avoidance of pestilence, and so became the site of Mycenaeus's renowned park. Mycenaeus was a patron of the arts. So the people who were once great, who avoided the crowd, who avoided the great rush, were thrown aside in history. And this is the fate of the kid. He separated himself from the mad rush. He did not pour his heart out into the common, as the judge says. Um, he, he will be forgotten. And there is a limelight. And the judge says that there's only room on a stage for one man in, in the stage of history. Um, and this is kind of a, a completion of the will. It's an honoring of the will. But the kid who's at the end of his life, guided by his precepts, guided by his estimations of values, um, it doesn't stand up to barefaced will. And so the decline of the West is little more than a natural progression of time to Spengler. And it may be that some refuse to be cast out of the limelight of history, like the judge. So to summarize briefly this section about Spengler and Nietzsche, because it was a lot, um, the judge is a Faustian figure. He no longer wishes to exist as a facet of the environment. He doesn't want to just be a part of things, like the people picking cotton in the beginning, like the people uh, at the end stoking the fire. He wants to be on the stage. And of course, only one person is allowed there. Dr. Cruz calls McCarthy's view of history pessimistic, which I have already disagreed with, but he expounds on Spengler's theory of the Faustian exchange, describing how Europe has sold its soul in order to unlock boundless intelligence and capability. Um, Cruz notes a quote from the judge, our mother, the earth was round like an egg and contained all good things within her. Um, he wants to crack the earth open, break into forms in order to harvest and acquire the power within them. Again, like Jacob Bamis said, um, we're all kind of these concealed things, uh, these shadowy and deceitful and shape-shifting things. But there's a light in us, and so there's something to break into and access. Um, again, the uh, Cruz quotes Milton and Satan instructing his minions to harvest materials from the earth for warfare. Um, and again, the connection to Spengler to reinforce is that McCarthy wrote a note, uh, grace comes from, in the absence of will from Spangler directly. Um, this also comes from Sutri. Uh, there's a passage that describes the need for an opponent, a description of like maybe the kid being swallowed up by the judge. Um, there's a point where I believe the protagonist in Sutri is looking at a reflection of himself that kind of goes away. It's like he doesn't see himself in the environment anymore. It's this destruction of the eye at the end of Sutri that coincides with the end of Blood Brilliant, where the kid has sacrificed the eye because he has renounced his will. Um, and whereas the judge is owning the eye, he says, it's just me. Um, in the book Blood Meridian, it essentially discusses how to preserve the eye through all of nature's horrors. Uh, renunciation of the will is a destruction of this eye, which is preserved through an accession to power how do you maintain yourself when the heart is beset by such a hell as the real world? And again, observing all that occurs, it's very hard to resist the urge to compassion, but it's something that is ultimately not conducive to what we really want. And so overall, I'd say Blood Meridian is the story of people who do not want to accept their own nature. They want to try to maintain these estimations of values, um, but overall, the bottom line is the human will is our only distinguishing feature and the only thing that will preserve us. We didn't get to Melville, but I think this video is long enough. I don't want to make it too long for anyone. Um, I would like to thank everyone for showing up. I got a like. That's pretty good. Um, uh, next week or sometime soon, I will be doing, without shaking the camera, The Passenger at some point, a book that people have also had some trouble with. Um, Blood Meridian is a very cryptic novel. I hope I did it some justice. Uh, I might do a video adding the Melville section, but I think it's 
there are a lot of places you can look for a great description of that. I wanted to prioritize Byron and Oswald Spangler in particular, and I think we did a lot of work there. Um, again, this book series is called Book by Book, not to be confused with another YouTuber called Leaf by Leaf, which I believe I put in the description, who is also fantastic. I just didn't know about him until a few moments ago. Um, and again, just a quick shout out to uh, NASA, Jar Slow, and some other people. Shire Beware is a character, or what am I saying, a user on Reddit, a real person, um, who is currently traveling through Chihuahua, Mexico, along the trail that McCarthy um, traveled or described in Blood Meridian, and they are making a film of it. So very fascinating, and if I hear anything else, I will definitely update everyone. Until then, it's been an hour and 20. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for watching and being involved. Please check out the description for all of our important info, uh, including a link to the Michael Cruz study. And until then, I will see you at our next discussion. Thank you.